Welcome to Attached, a podcast about the loved ones we're attached to and the good, the bad, and the ugly advice about those relationships that maybe we shouldn't be so attached to. We here at Attached want to share ways to enhance your relationships and debunk all of that bad relationship advice using science. Science. It's where it's at, y'all. I'm Dr. Patricia Robertson out of the University of Tennessee. I'm Dr. Jacob Priest from the University of Iowa. And I'm Dr. Sarah Woods at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Today, Jacob is going to bring us something that gives us insight into the intersection of physics and human behavior in pop and culture. Whoa! Oh, whoa! <laughs> actually, no. Don't say actually. Oh, I'm trying to make them as outrageous as possible. I thought that one would really be a. a I'm going to think about a way I can get physics in here one time, even though I know nothing about physics. Gravity. Gravity. Then in the academic deep dive, we're going to discuss an academic article, the gut reaction to couples relationship troubles, a route to gut dysbiosis through changes in depressive symptoms. And then in good or bad advice, we're going to discuss advice we found and other people found for us. Thank you from Twitter and Instagram. In fact, if you have advice you'd like us to talk about, send it to us. You can email us at attachpodcast at gmail.com, tweet us, Facebook us, Instagram us at attachpodcast, or or go to attachpodcast.com and send us a message. Also, we're now on YouTube, so please uh, smash that YouTube subscribe button or, you know, gently hit it, whatever your mood dictates, and follow us there for video versions of each of our podcast episodes. Also, remember, rate and review this podcast wherever you're listening to it. But before we get to all of that goodness for this episode, how are you all doing? What's up? Talk to me. Not much is up in Iowa. We are buried under about a foot of snow. Supposed to then the end of the week, potentially have a little bit of a polar vortex, which means our high will be about three degrees. Yikes. So the nice thing about about that is, you know, we don't. It's the nice thing over. about this. I'm, I'm waiting. The nice thing about this. <laughs> you don't have on. to reframe everything. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> this, all deserve. <laughs> this sounds a little bit like toxic positivity, but we'll listen. Go on. Yeah, go I ahead. Mean, the nice thing about it is like, we wouldn't want to leave our house anyway. So it's like, mm. you know, quarantine, snow, they kind of go together and you just have like a double reason to just do nothing but watch Netflix on your couch. And that's basically all we're doing right now. Nice. So I wish I had something exciting to report about (laughs) what we're doing, but all we're doing, the snow is really pretty, but it's really cold and I don't want to go outside. Thank you, Vortex, for encouraging healthy behavior. Good choices. (laughs) I mean, relaxation, like, that's got to be good for you, right? Sure. Yeah, no, definitely. Science. Thank you. Science. Science says relaxation is good. Maybe not like lounging around all day. Yeah, That's I'm, I'm probably sure there's not. A, sure. I'm sure there's it's a curvilinear okay. relish, relationship okay. there somewhere. He reframed every single piece of his life, which is totally fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> That's yeah, how you survive exactly. the, the winter, winter in, the in Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> you only like have to like reframe it. And then Jay. you like, and then you go into the doom spiral every once in a while. You're like, oh. I got to move. I got to find something else. <laughs> Where are we going? Oh, is it March? It must be about March. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. When it's still winter in March, you're like, oh no. Gotta, gotta uh, skip my life. Jacob is the embodiment of that meme of that little dog sitting in a fire, a room full of fire saying everything's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Except it needs as- to be like freezing cold. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I think actually, as long as I've known Jacob, which has been a long time now, he has been that dog in the fire, <laughs> perfectly capable of saying, oh yeah, this is totally fine. That's fine. Everything's good it's here. Fine. We're it's good. totally fine. It's good. It's good. It's awesome. <laughs> well, good. I'm totally happy for you. I'm totally Thank happy you. that you're, you're, this is fine. I'm totally happy for you. What? I appreciate that. <laughs> I have been very clumsy lately. <laughs> this is, I don't have like a- Wait, wait, wait. wait. Can we not- I, Seeing that I've known you for a long time, I don't think that qualifier is actually correct. Lately, <laughs> it's not, it's okay. not true. So I couldn't exactly, I couldn't exactly remember if that was a quality you guys knew about me slash I was pretending that you forgot. I am very clumsy. I, I am also athletically inclined. No, I'm not. I can't even say it. <laughs> 
Um, but I just am not very coordinated. And so my husband always jokes when I start to like do anything where I get kind of too excited and start moving around a little bit, which happens a lot when you have a small child, right? Okay. Like easy, but slow down, like (laughs) take it. But he wasn't there to protect me on Friday. And (laughs) my daughter and I were like, oh, we're going to, we heard my husband get on a zoom meeting in the room. We're like, oh, we're going to go like bust in there, like surprise him. Or we were just being silly. I mean, I took uh, three steps at a light jog. I mean, this was (laughs) in the middle of the kitchen and I tripped and stumbled and stumble ran across the house face first into a door and oh, no. I mean I took my daughter down with me because we were holding hands oh my gosh my husband came to the door and was like what is going on I was thinking that we were joking and then saw Charlotte on the floor like betting my head I mean it was it was it was brutal so oh, no. I've been you know icing my joints and feeling oh, aged no. and that's all yeah, I've been up to my usual lately. <laughs> Jesse said he really wished it had been captured on video because he he's had to like literally save me multiple times. Mm-hmm. One time I tripped at the top of a set of giant stairs and essentially flew down them head first and he caught <gasps> my head right at the bottom because he was already oh. there. <laughs> right before it hit the top. Oh floor. my gosh. And I was like, you ready to go to the mall? Let's go. <laughs> 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 ah! Everything about this is fine. This happens all the time, which it does. That's oh all. I, that's what well, I've been up to. I'm glad you're safe. I'm glad you're yeah. safe. Thanks. I'm glad you survived. So pandemic parenting is always an adventure in creativity. My children, seven and four, have taken to play fighting a lot recently, <laughs> which I remember doing that with my siblings. It's, you know, it is what it is, but, you know, people end up getting hurt. So... For the first couple of months when they started this behavior, my response was, no, you guys, every this is consensual. You guys both agree to be play fighting. Okay. Now don't hurt each other. Now it has to be gentle play fighting. Right. That was like I love how beginning. you phrase it as consensual. Like, well, like you don't, you I know, don't want it. It seems like a weird word to use with like fighting. We use it all the time in the house. We use it all the time. Are you both on the same page? Obviously I only have one child. So I'm talking to my husband and my daughter. <laughs> The sword fights, that's, we're both in we're, on this. Oh, this okay. Is, all right, all right, step away. But now I'm at the point where that was not doing any good. So I, about a week ago, decided we're, we're changing this. I'm saying if anybody gets hurt, both people go to timeout. End of story. Both people go to timeout. Okay. So I remind them when they start play fighting that this is the rule. They can say, okay, and then they just go at it. So this morning I looked over and my seven-year-old is like, he's like, are you okay? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> to my four-year-old and he's holding his nose. And I said, did somebody get hurt? And my four-year-old goes, no, 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 I'm not hurt. I'm not hurt. And I realized in that moment that maybe that backfired. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was talking to my husband and I said, I don't know if it's, if it's good. Am I teaching them now to like hide pain? Like, what is For this? Sure. And my husband goes, keep secrets. Well, yeah, exactly. Keep secrets and all of these things like, you know, push down pain when you're hurt. All of these things we don't necessarily want to teach children. And my, my husband goes, no, it was it was one of your best parenting decisions. It's really good. He said, I also think it will cut down on crying. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like what what is your desired outcome? That's really what you're measuring here, right? Like and I was like, oh, is it okay. for the good of the children or the good of the parents? <laughs> I feel like that's mutually beneficial. I'm not saying this is good advice. Right? Like this is not you're something I'm in endorsing. Science, right? You're not you're not saying this is science. The uh, jury's still out if that was a good parenting decision or not. I'll keep you guys posted in like 10 years with like my uh, <laughs> My kids are like, have a broken leg and are like, shake it off, shake it off. It's fine. Don't tell mom. Well, no, it was a bad decision. <laughs> Swallow your feelings. Keep it in. Like, feel it. It's fine. It's fine. Adventures in parenting, huh? I know. Oh my gosh. Always something new. Uh, but at least they were comforting each other though, right? Yeah. Like that's. I mean, maybe you were like, teaching empathy. You just didn't realize it. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Refrain. Yeah. You know how <laughs> I'll go, I'll go I am. Now. Thank you, Jacob. You're welcome. First 
up pop and culture. We learn about relationships from our friends and family, but a lot of what we think about love and relationships come from what we see in pop culture. For this first segment, we'd like to take a moment to highlight events in pop culture that influence people's lives and how we view relationships. Stakes are high, Jacob. What do you got for us this week? I feel like getting a little bit of that pressure there. So for those longtime podcast listeners, you know that we, our friends actually outside the podcast, like we just don't fake it for the podcast. I just wanted to clarify that because I, we were in another meeting and Patricia mentioned that she was watching The Expanse on Amazon Prime and I didn't take her request to, or like her recommendation to watch it, but it did like start me searching on Amazon Prime, which resulted in a, me watching a completely different show that okay. I- been watched really quickly and that I want to talk about today because I think it illustrates a very important relationship principle. Are we ready? Uh, all, always. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you for asking for our consent. We are consenting. Yes, yeah. that's right. We're I want it to be a, a, a consensual <laughs> engagement in pop and culture. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Go on. Um, so have you either of you seen or heard of the television show on Amazon Prime, Flack, with Anna Paquin? Oh, I have heard of it. You know I have I haven't. seen it. Flack centers on Anna Paquin's character, Robin. And Robin is currently living in London because she and her sister, Ruth, kind of left New York City, Philadelphia area. I don't remember exactly which, because their mom had severe mental illness. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the show, we learned that the mom died by suicide. And so they're trying to navigate this loss and kind of still be each other's family. Robin actually has worked at a big PR firm and the whole premise of the show is she's trying to clean up messes that celebrities make and all the unethical and crazy things she does to try to make celebrities still look like they have this polished image. But the, the thing I wanna talk about today is one of the more kind of arcs of the the first season of Flack, which is centers on the relationship between Ruth and Robin, the two sisters. You know, the season starts out and they have this very close relationship, but midway through the season, Ruth's husband, Mark, loses his job and he's super ashamed of it. Mm. And so he actually goes to Robin and says, what am I gonna do? How is this gonna navigate? We can't tell Ruth. We can't let her know. I don't want to let her know. So Robin keeps this secret for Mark. And as things play out, like they have to go to more and more lengths to keep the secret from Ruth. And Robin continues kind of this descent into problematic drug use, problematic relationships, until finally she's kind of at rock bottom. Mm. And then, of course, Ruth finds out about this secret and calls Robin and says, hey, I just found out Mark lost his job a long time ago. What's going on? I can't believe this. What do I do with this? I don't know. And then, you know, Robin's like, oh, no. And Ruth goes, (laughs) did you know about this? Yeah. And then starts this, you know, this big rift of like, what were you, why were you keeping the secret from me? Why did you feel like you need to protect me? And then Robin, who's in this state of needing help from somebody she can really rely on and cares about, ends up getting kind of pushed out of Ruth's life because she helped her husband lie and she's kind of doing all of treating Ruth as if she was one of, you know, a client. And so I think what this kind of brings home to me is Ruth in the end, at the end of the season, has to set a really a really firm boundary. And in thinking about this whole process throughout the season, we often talk about boundaries and setting boundaries. Right. But we don't often explain what that means, right? We use this word a lot on the podcast of like, you have to have clear boundaries, but what exactly are clear boundaries and how do you set them? And I think that often a boundary is equated with saying no, or cutting out a person from your life, which can be one way to set a boundary, but isn't the only way, Okay. right? Right. Boundaries are really about defining what is okay for you and what is not okay for you. And what aspects you will let this person in your life and what aspects you won't let this person in your life. It's about defining who you are in the context of another person and who that person is 
in, in the context of their relationship with you. Now, healthy boundaries tend to be fluid, right? I actually think that Ruth is setting a healthy boundary with Robin by at one time they were close, but when Robin starts to engage in a way that's toxic and problematic, yeah. Ruth sets a clear boundary say, okay, you can't treat me like this. If we are going to have a close connected relationship, we need to be able to know that these behaviors are not acceptable. And so the boundary is really, I am not going to return your phone calls and I'm not going to let you come into my home until you get to a place where you are healthy. So I, you know, I think that, you know, likely what will happen is there'll be a repair, right? And a repair in a relationship is part of setting a boundary. It's saying that I want you here. I want you to be a part of my life, but also there's, there's some things that, are not okay. There are some things that I won't accept. And that if you cross that line, if you do those things to, you know, lie to me, engage in toxic behaviors, I am going to, again, kind of take a step back from this relationship, right? So setting boundaries doesn't mean just telling people, no, healthy boundaries are about this ability to Mm -hmm. navigate over the course of time and in a relationship, this connectedness and this kind of, okay, this is where I need space. This is what is not acceptable for me. So when you think about setting healthy boundaries with people, it doesn't mean cutting them out of your life or just learning how to say no. Healthy boundaries are a combination of yes and no, mm, depending like on the relationship, the time, and the context. If you decide to watch Flack, and there's, it's probably, it's not a show for kids. Okay, this is not <laughs> one you want to have your children come into the room and watch with you. But if you decide to watch it, I think Ruth's character is a good illustration of what boundaries can and should look like. And knowing that at different times, the level of closeness you have to certain family members, certain relationships in your life is going to change. And that's a sign of healthy boundaries. And that ability to be flexible when it's important, meaning having a a more rigid boundary or having a more flexible boundary is an important thing to learn in navigating relationships across life course. Yeah, this is also kind of reminding me of a, a couple of episodes back when we were talking about communicating expectations, that having expectations isn't of friends, family, loved ones isn't a problem, but you have to communicate those expectations. The same with boundaries, right? Like having a boundary is fantastic, importance of flexibility, but also communicating those those boundaries and what those look like is also important. So it, what you're saying kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Is that fair, you think? Yeah, I think one way to set a boundary is communicating expectations right? And actually communication isn't just about words. It's also about behaviors and interaction. So if you're going to say, these are my expectations, but then when the person doesn't respect those expectations or live up to those expectations and you're like, ah, like your behaviors don't reflect that, then you're actually not setting a boundary. So I think it's important that your behaviors, the interactions you have with this person reflect the expectations that you have. And sometimes that's the hardest part, right? Sometimes you can say things, but actually adhering to those boundaries to protect yourself or be flexible can be really, really challenging too. Yeah. But check out Flack. It's great. We'll do. I'm on it. Now we're going to move to our academic deep dive segment and talk about a new paper titled The Gut Reaction to Couple Relationship Troubles, a route to gut dysbiosis through changes in depressive symptoms, written by a large team of researchers at Ohio State and Southern Methodist University, led by Dr. Janice Kiekel glazer Published in this month's issue of the Journal of Psychoneuroendocrinology, this study focuses on changes in gut microbiota predicted by the quality of relationships. So first, what is gut microbiota? This refers to all of the natural microorganisms that exist in gastrointestinal tract that help our bodies maintain homeostasis. In other words, we have bacteria that naturally live in our body, sometimes referred to as good bacteria, that help our immune system to function and helps us to metabolize our food and get energy from our diet. However, this collection of trillions of bacteria can get out of whack, a non-scientific term, of course. (laughs) And and if the gut starts to have fewer kinds of microbes and the types of bacteria living in there becomes disproportionate to one another, this can initiate a problematic chain reaction of heightened inflammation 
and potentially accelerated disease and aging. One process that impacts maladaptive changes in our gut microbiota is our autonomic nervous system's reaction to stress and depression. Though the authors point out it's still a bit unclear what these changes look like for chronically stressed adults. So what does all of this have to do with relationships? Well, these authors are interested in how stressed marriages may have a negative effect on our gut microbiota, given the impact that relationship distress can have on our mood. Specifically, they point out that, quote, marital discord carries a tenfold increased risk for depressive symptomology, as well as greater risk for syndromal depression, which may then influence bacterial diversity in our gut. So we've never talked about microbiomes. So Sarah, these researchers looked at links between couples relationships, depression, and gut microbiota. Obviously, I'm very curious about what the results were. I'm also kind of curious about how they access these sure. gut microbiota. I think I have an idea of how they do it, but that I, sounds like I fun. think we're going to look at poop. I think we're <laughs> going to look at poop. Well, we're not going to. <laughs> <laughs> Can you help us understand what they did, how they did it, and what they found? Sure. So yes, what they were curious about is how the relationship quality in couples at baseline in their Mm -hmm. project was linked to changes in depressive symptoms, as well as the diversity and richness of the gut microbiota. And they also looked at leaky gut markers across two time points which was about two to seven months apart. So what is a leaky gut? Yeah. So, yeah, it's, I could see your face. Your face was like, mm, what it's a, it's a good question that I had yeah. in my mind too, Sarah. Yeah, I prepared for it because like. I, I too was like, yes, yes, tell me more. So this is kind of a, a colloquial term for greater gut barrier permeability, which means mm. that more of the bacteria that should be located in the gastrointestinal tract escapes to the blood than oh. it should, which okay. can then kick off the systemic inflammatory response in our body. So that's that's problematic, right? So that's one possible pathway that they're curious about that might kind of impact and influence disease tied to the stress in relationships. So they had a baseline question of whether couples would have more similar microbiotas than random unrelated pairs of people, which is okay. something that we already know from the research. So to baseline, they were looking to kind of replicate this finding because okay. when people share households, when they're cohabiting, they have similar patterns of diet, exercise, sleep, alcohol consumption, et cetera, that would impact kind of what, what bacteria are found in, in their GI tract. They were also then curious about whether greater stress in the marriage would then lead to worse depressive symptoms and problematic declines in gut diversity and richness, as well as greater gut permeability. So that's the direction of the hypothesis, but also whether increased depressive symptoms would be associated with worse changes in gut diversity, richness, and permeability. So, and then they also looked at, which we'll talk a little bit about whether that link between depression and the worse worsening of the gut microbiota was because of the depression or was it because of changes in health behaviors that oh. would be associated with depression, right? So if I'm yeah. more depressed, do I sleep less? Do I exercise less? Do I drink more, et cetera? And is that what's changing? How do I eat? My inside? Do I eat less yogurt? Right. Oh yes. Yogurt. <laughs> That's a good one. So Jamie you Lee do Curtis. know something about bacteria. That's good. Everybody knows that because of Jamie Lee Curtis and Activia uh, on the poop couch. There you go. <laughs> I am certain I wasn't prepared for that. (laughs) So so these researchers used data from 162 individuals that were part of couples. The average age of these participants was 41.6 years old. They had been together an average of 14 and a half years. Almost all of them were married. They were also 87% white, 69% full-time employed. So when we do research like this, we often see that we tend to kind of skew towards a more educated, more employed, more white sample, a little more affluent sample because they're doing lab visits and kind of more intrusive data collection. But they also shared that 85% of their sample had never smoked, an average BMI of 27. So they were also on average healthier. Yes. So they excluded anybody up front that had recent antibiotic use, 
maybe they ate a bunch of yogurt. No, they didn't. They didn't. Um, <laughs> if they were pregnant or breastfeeding, if they had recent cancer or different autoimmune disorders, okay. MS, a whole slew of kind of so, problematic chronic conditions. So they were so also potentially them. weeding out people who maybe were less healthy, which is why their final mm-hmm. sample ended up being so very healthy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Correct. And those are things that would then obviously impact kind of your microbiota. Right. So these participants completed two study visits for non-fasting blood draws. So they had their blood drawn and they completed some surveys and those were on average about three months apart. After each visit, they then received a U biome kit to collect a stool sample. And that's what they analyzed for microbiota DNA which is what you all were curious about. And now you can tune out. You can stop listening. Yes, <laughs> yes, we got to the poop. You <laughs> found it. They quantified then how diverse the DNA were and how many different types of DNA were observed, which is kind of how they looked at the richness of the microbiota. And then the blood samples captured biomarkers that demonstrated that microbial translocation, that permeability, uh-huh. that leaky gut process. So what they found was on average, there was not... And on average, across the whole sample, a change in diversity. In fact, almost half of uh, almost half of people decreased in diversity, but on average, not really any change. Okay. A small increase in richness over time, but in general, the sample is fairly similar from visit so, to visit. So what they found was, as they predicted, individuals' gut bacteria were more similar to their spouse than to mm. same-sex individuals, participants who were not their spouse. And my microbiota as a participant is more similar from visit one to visit two than it is kind of within me and my my spouse. So in general, mm. on average, your microbiome is fairly stable. They're looking to predict changes in that, but on, on average, mine stays the most similar to mine, which is just- Fairly funny. stable. And this is over three yeah. months, right? Three months? On average, the two visits are three months three apart, months but they could range from two to seven. Yep. Right. So then what they found was that lower marital satisfaction at that first lab visit was not associated with bacteria diversity or richness, but it was associated with an increased biomarker that measures that gut permeability. So they oh. named that biomarker lipopolysaccharide binding protein. As one they does. didn't name it. I believe, <laughs> I believe they borrowed the term. Yes, right. But for those, for those of us who have never heard that term before, it is a measure of leaky gut. So lower marrow okay. satisfaction at baseline was associated with an increased biomarker of that permeability over time as well as lower marital satisfaction at baseline was associated with an increase in depression from visit one to visit two, which when they then looked at changes in depressive symptoms, Mm -hmm. that was associated with decreased microbiota diversity and richness. Whereas conversely, if my depression symptoms decreased over those few months, they found increase in the diversity and richness over time. So changes in depression was not associated with leaky gut measures, okay. but it was associated with diversity, diversity. and richness. Mm-hmm. And then we had talked about those health behaviors earlier. What they found was that when they looked at specific aspects of depression, a lot of this effect seemed potentially driven by negative affect, meaning it seemed to be more about feeling badly than about feeling less. So about the anhedonia piece, which is a way to kind of label like feeling very flat or like you cannot experience happiness or pleasure in anything. It was more about that negative effect of feeling irritable and like you're not worthwhile and feeling badly. And it was not associated with really any meaningful measures of health behaviors. So there was a link between an increase in depression and less sleep. But when they controlled for that sleep piece, Mm -hmm. that did not explain the connection between depression and the changes in gut microbiota over time. So it's really that depression affect that is linked to microbiota, not that potential mediation of health behaviors. Yes. Which this is over three months. So it's still a relatively short period of time. Right. And it's not a test of mediation, meaning it's not a test of marital stress being linked to depression, being linked to later right. microbiome okay. change. It is only two time points, which is important that they're tracking this over time, but it is also kind of a next step in what I imagine is going to be a series of projects for this group is important. I, I think it's also important to kind of include the caveat, especially for listeners that are not 
gut microbiota experts, which or like pod, <laughs> podcast hosts that are not go, go, microbiota sure. biota experts and can hardly sure. pronounce it. Right. Sure. Like all of us. But I, I think it's important to kind of the caveat that it's unclear how clinically relevant it is. Mm. So the authors make an important case for how changes in the bacteria that exist and proliferate in our GI tract are tied to disease. We didn't track these people long enough to see if they develop right any kind right. of cardiovascular disease or whether they develop any kind of serious autoimmune disorder, et cetera. So what I think is important as takeaways is that they did find that bacterial diversity and riches in the gut decreased in tandem with an increase in depressive symptoms found for people with lower marital satisfaction. So it's right. a, it's a, an interesting kind of new science that shows that gut reactions to our relationships are important. So the quality, huh. yeah, I like the like pun. That? I got it. I got it. Thank you. The quality of our relationships has direct and indirect impacts on our health, which we know from lots of other kinds of research, but this is a new way to look at this. So what they point out is this lower bacterial diversity is found in things like diabetes and obesity and starts to reflect chronic elevated systemic inflammation that is linked to disease and aging. And for people where they're experiencing marital distress and depression, those right. two things work together synergistically to increase the risk for disease. Mm. So it is valuable then on a cellular level to take care of our relationships because that stress has serious impacts on every part of our body over time. And, and clearly the much more research, like you're saying, needs to happen to make it clinically irrelevant, right? We, we don't know, do, do you change the gut microbiome and this will fix everything? That's not what this research is saying. It's just saying that we know these things are linked, therefore we need to investigate further. Okay. That sounds like gut microbiota could potentially be a link or a mediator between relationships, process symptoms, and long-term health outcomes. Yeah. Or exactly. maybe... You should eat yogurt while having tough conversations with your spouse. No, I don't, I don't no. know if that's what it's saying. But... Usually do that anyways, though, just in case it's a <laughs> science. Yeah, no, you know, just just in case. Anytime you're having tough conversations, mm -hmm. click pause. Say, let's get some yogurt real quick. This episode of Attach Podcast sponsored by Faye. Faye, good Greek for your. Yogurt. I... <laughs> Good, good for your relationships. And These your researchers did, just to be clear, nothing about yogurt. <laughs> There's nothing about like the specific diet influence. They <laughs> assessed it, they controlled for it, et cetera, but they were not sponsored by Big Yogurt. Big Yogurt. <laughs> I don't know, something. Dairy. It this episode out. brought to you by naturally fermented sauerkraut. That's true. Or isn't that just like... Clearly we are microbiota experts. <laughs> this is going south. Oh, dear. We apologize. Woohoo! Boo! Woohoo! Yeah! It's finally time for good or bad advice, where we talk about pervasive relationship advice in our culture. We hear relationship advice from parents, family, and friends. We see advice about how to be in relationships from movies and TV shows. And we, particularly myself, read endless advice spewed at us on the social medias, blogs, and numerous top 10 lists. But a lot of it just isn't actually good for our relationships. This is the part of the show where we use science, mind you, to decide if the advice is good or bad. If you have seen or heard some advice you'd like us to talk about, send it to us. Pretty please email us at attachedpodcast at gmail.com or tweet us, Instagram us, Facebook us at attached podcast, or just go straight to attachedpodcast.com and send us a message there. While you're at it, please like and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app or YouTube, and share it with your loved ones. You know they want to hear this. You know they want to laugh. You know they want to get some good advice into their system. First, from Instagram, at underscore Danielle Robin, sent to us, <laughs> sent to me, from the one and only Sarah Woods. Oh, did I? <laughs> Thank you. That's exciting. Stop looking for 
a secure, in quote, partners. Mm -hmm. So this is something I hear a lot. I just need to find a secure partner. I can only date secure people. There are a couple of things wrong with this approach. One, attachment is a spectrum. The quest for a secure person is a pretty thankless quest because everyone gets triggered and everyone reacts with either wave, anxious, or island, avoidant, tendencies. Some people react less than others, sure, and that's something we can all strive for, but anxious and avoidant self-protective reactions are inside of all of us. So focus on finding a human being who is willing to do the work to soothe and ground themselves when they get triggered. Someone who is willing to start rewriting their own limiting beliefs and healing their inner child. Two, if you're just focusing on finding a secure partner, you're not focusing in the right place which is you. No person can fix you. A lot to unpack there. Good or bad advice. Stop looking for a secure partner. There is a lot to unpack. So I'm going to do this in little chunks. Do it. Hopefully I won't take too long. If I drown on, just tell me to be quiet. (laughs) Okay. So first, I really- Spoken like a truly secure person. (laughs) It's too much for you. You just let me know. So first, I do think that this idea of secure and insecure people is something that attachment research doesn't actually play out. Sure, we have internal working models or uh, ideas about relationships in our head, but really an attachment relationship is a system. And in other words, when you enter into that system, you and your partner create it through your interactions, through your experiences. And just because you had a secure attachment system with one person doesn't mean that you are going to have a secure attachment relationship with another. When they look at multiple attachment relationships, some researchers find that these look so different from each other. So there's not just, you are not just a secure person. You can be in a secure attachment system. But that doesn't mean, I mean, here's the second part, that it's going to necessarily always continue like that, right? The other piece of this advice is that like, you're going to be triggered. You're going to engage in behaviors where you're going to want more closeness, or you're going to want more space. You're going to want more connection, or you're going to want more distance. And those are normal aspects of a relationship. And I I think this third piece of finding somebody that's willing to do the work on themselves is important. Uh, Where I think maybe not the great advice is, is, you know, they started, there's not a secure person. And then they're like, but you can only fix you. No, like if you are a part of a system, that person is going to be there for you to be able to connect with them, to be a part of your emotion regulation process, right? You are not like human beings need each other to deal with those strong emotions. And sure, you, you're not the only one that can fix you. That's why you have a a connection. And sometimes the person you're one attachment system with isn't going to be available to you. And that's why you have multiple attachment systems. And so I think it's important to realize that it's not just about fixing you. You sure you're the only one that can enact changes, but we need people. We need those connections because they help us and they help us regulate those strong attachment emotions that come up for us. So overall, I think good advice, but just make sure you were not going back from, there's not a secure person, but only you can fix yourself. Like right. those two individualistic stances, I, I I don't agree with. Okay, right. So remember, think of attachment as a, as a systemic process that we can have different attachment styles with different people, but bad kind of, if we're going to say anything is bad advice is the, you can only fix yourself, that individualistic look when thinking about the system. So some good and bad advice in there, Woods. I'm going to say this is good advice only because I have literally never heard someone say, I am looking for a secure partner. Mm -hmm. And so if this person is hearing this a lot, then the people that are sharing this have taken their read of the attachment literature way too far. (laughs) <laughs> because I don't, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to try to type other people and only decide I'm only looking for people in this category of secure right. attachment. That feels like a really, a wild misunderstanding of how attachment works and taking the research way too far. 
And it also sounds a little bit like a avoided <laughs> attachment, like purposely sure. trying to distance yourself from many, many right. people by right. setting up these very obscure boundaries. Yeah. But that's just me. Yeah. So I guess good advice, because I would also say, stop that, like, stop, like what happened? <laughs> what happened? To you? Excuse me. Will you fill out this survey, please? <laughs> yeah, right. oh, would you like to go oh, on a right. date? Right. Because those nine items are obviously going to tell you everything that you need about mm-hmm. a life right. partner anyways. Yeah, I think Goodness. so. So good advice. Stop searching for quote unquote. And I like that they put in quotes, a securely attached person. The other part of this that I think is really good advice and want your thoughts on it is the idea that it's not so much of the attachment style, right? Like if you happen to be giving your dates this questionnaire, it's not necessarily the attachment style because we all have tendencies of being anxious or avoidant depending whenever we're triggered, but the capacity to self-soothe, like these coping mechanisms, right? Is really what you want to look for in a partner, not necessarily their inherent anxious or avoidant tendencies, but do they have the capacity to self-soothe, to communicate through those triggering moments, I think is also really important when looking for a partner. Good Uh, point. And I really like that they brought that up because we all have inherent tendencies that are not fantastic. I mean, we're human, we all have them, but can you recognize it? Can you self-soothe through that? I think is really, really. And are you willing to work on it? Right. Recognize it work on it, self-soothe, all of those things. So thank you. Good advice over overall, especially when we're thinking about it in terms of a system. So next is from Twitter. It is by I'm close to caring. <laughs> I just, I love that handle. It's about redemption. And I, I brought this one up because I really like the concept of, of redemption because we see it in a lot of movies right? And TV shows is that the bad or evil character has a redemption arc. So this is what I'm close to caring says about redemption. Redemption arcs need to be less, it's never too late to do the right thing. And more, you're responsible for your actions and being good is something that you have to choose and actively work towards. Because the former treats doing one good act as the entirety of the redemption. If there's no acknowledgement of the villain's actions, the effects they have on their victims, plus the victims being able to voice their feelings, the villain suffering the consequences of their actions, showing remorse, actively trying to do better, et cetera, it isn't a redemption arc. So good or bad advice? I think a couple of things about this. So in my experience in working with clients who have had relationships that have been toxic and damaging, abusive, is that oftentimes the villain, if we're going to put it in this context, isn't going to recognize that, right? Like this redemption arc in and of itself, a lot of times, even if the person comes to them, voices their concerns, the person is not willing or is unable to hear it, right? Like if you've had parents who weren't there for you in the way you wanted, Going to them and saying, hey, you weren't there in the way I wanted oftentimes doesn't, they're like, what are you talking about? Like, I I did the best I could. Like, so I think, you know, this redemption arc is problematic because it creates good guys and bad guys. And I think that they're the context of what people experience in relationships. And I'm going to set aside like really abusive, like adverse childhood experiences, relationships for for a little bit here. You know, like when we think about, uh, you know, this person wasn't there for me like I wanted them to be. And if I go and I talk to them and I engage with them, they're going to hear me and they're going to change their ways. Sometimes that can set us up for re-victimization for more pain because Mm -hmm. often people who are important to us and who have hurt us don't want to hear that they've hurt us. And so I think that if we are hoping for people to be vastly different than they've been throughout the the course Mm -hmm. of their whole lives, and we seek to because of our pain, say, hey, come and accept that, sometimes that is not going to be present. Sometimes it is, but a lot of people aren't going to be willing to hear that. So really where redemption comes is from alleviating ourselves from the emotional reactivity and the dependence we have on potentially repairing that relationship. So really, if you, and and forming healthy relationships on our own that we aren't so 
reliant or dependent on the approval or acceptance of this person who potentially will never provide it for us. So I think redemption arcs can be really interesting to movies and televisions and, and books yeah. and make for interesting stories, but don't necessarily reflect the reality of many people who have felt wronged in close relationships and ha- hope, you know, like are hoping that that person is going to see the error of their ways and, and turn again and, and own up and take responsibility. Because a lot of times those people aren't capable or are unwilling to do that. So, so good advice. So what we're saying is kind of good advice that redemption arcs in movies don't reflect life, but also bad advice that maybe we don't need redemption arcs in real life. Yeah. I think that they can be there, but if we're expecting, like if we had a partner cheat cheat on us, right. And we, you know, it may be that they accept that work through that. And a lot of people do, but they may never do that. They may never own up to that. They may never say it ha- like they can make choices based on their self-protection. So if we're expecting to have somebody redeem themselves all the time, they may continue to let us down. So I don't okay. think we should ever put all our eggs in the redemption basket is what I'm saying. Okay. So bad advice because we don't put all of our eggs in that <laughs> redemption basket, which is interesting to me, Jacob, because what I hear you saying and please correct me if I'm hearing this wrong. In the last advice, we're really focused on systemic perceptions of relationships, which I fully agree with. But this one sounds a little less systemic in that it's more individualistic, right? That we have to do our own self-soothing and seek out if this one in this relationship is talk to me about how I'm misinterpreting that. So I would see it just a little bit different. Please. Right. Like, so a lot of the people I work with in, in my clinical practice are in their like twenties and thirties. And a lot of times the narratives are like, my parents let me down. Okay. They weren't ever there for me in a way. And I want to go talk to them. And I want to just tell them everything they did wrong and everything they need to change. And oftentimes when people do that, their parents dismiss them, don't listen to them, right. won't engage in that conversation because the parents don't necessarily see it that way. And so in that case, right, it is about creating other attachments, right? It's about understanding what those people who are in your life are important are able to give and what they're not, right? Okay. right? They may not be able to give you your redemption story, but by creating other relationships that are meaningful, connected, and provide those people that can respond and, you know, own up to their mistakes is kind of where the redemption story lies. But if we put it all in focusing on that one singular relationship, that's, I think, when we get let down. Thank you. That that makes more sense. All right. Woods, good or bad advice? I think this is great advice. I think it is the difference between allowing somebody to continue to treat you badly, that any time that they do kind of one nice thing that you decide kind of they're absolved of all their prior actions. And I don't think that there is, I think the process of forgiveness without accountability is problematic. And so I think Mm. this is really good advice that somebody doing something to hurt another person that they're close to needs to be open to and willing to think about what they have done that is hurtful and to allow that person to share how they were hurt and then to be accountable for their actions and think about how going forward we want to do this different. So I think this is great advice. So Woods with good advice. And what I like about these, always these pieces is that we approach it different ways, right? Like Jacob approached it like, should there be redemption arcs, period? And then Woods, if there is a redemption arc, what should it look like? So I think both are valid and both are are true. And I really like that this one person, wonderful, I'm close to caring, brought up a really interesting conversation about among us should there be redemption arcs and I like the idea of seeking support and attachment from other people like Jacob was saying but also if we are to engage in this redemption arc within our lives one action does not redeem a person necessarily moving to number three from instagram at rising woman we hear a lot in relationship advice kind of stuff 
the idea of red flags in relationships. And, and this person put together a list of green flags in relationships. Ooh. As always, we will post this. There are a number of, of green flags just for here. Just going to list a few. The relationship inspires you to be your best self, to be accountable and to shine love into the world. Good or bad advice about a green flag in relationships. So <laughs> I think there are <laughs> green flags in relationships. I think the way that is worded is really problematic. Oh, tell us, talk on it, speak on um, it, do it, Jacob. I also want to be in relationship where it's okay to not be my best self every single day. Right. Oh, right? That sounds like a lot of pressure. You know, like this idea that when I'm with you, my light wants to shine forth and I feel really ecstatic all the time. Like that's, the, yeah, a lot, a lot of pressure. So I think, I think good advice to try to recognize, and there may be other really good green flags in here to recognize things that you see as positive and beneficial and of somebody you'd want to form a partnership with or a friendship with or whatever. But I also think that the expectation that when you're with this person, you're always going to be your best self is inherently problematic. Right. You want to be in a relationship where you can have good days, bad days, hard days, exciting days, happy days, sad days, and all of those things can be okay. And there's space for it. So good for good advice for looking for green flags, bad advice of thinking you need to be your best self around this person, especially all the time. So I'm just going to do this, this one piece of advice as bad advice. Woods, relationships that inspire you to be your best self accountable and shine love into the world, good or bad yeah. advice? Mm, bad advice, <laughs> first of all, like way too high of a bar, just way too high. And it doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's actually very relationally oriented. It sounds like find a partner who inspires you to be your right. best self and kind of carry the team and then is responsible for how you feel. And also like, it's just way too high. It's just way too high of a bar. But, but then you've set a bar so high that also is not measurable. How in the world do I know what my best self is? I mean, maybe you all feel like you know, and maybe this last year has just <laughs> destroyed my best self. I, I don't know. <laughs> but I don't have some like vision of here's what I want to achieve. And I better find this partner that's going to like help me get to this ultimate goal. And here's exactly what it includes. Objective one, objective two. I, I just don't know what that looks like. And so it feels way lofty, but also I can never achieve it. I, yeah. I agree with Jacob. I would rather, much rather have permission to occasionally be my worst self and be forgiven or to have somebody be gentle with me when I, that's how I feel than to right. describe to be euphoric. All the time. It sounds exhausting. So <sighs> generally bad advice. Next, the climate of the relationship is consistent, not chaotic. Good or bad advice. So this is another one of the green flags. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is another one of the green flags. Sorry. There's, there. There's several of them. I'm probably just going to read two more. I like this idea. I think this is good advice, except I would probably add one word to it to make it okay. even better advice. I love, I love Jacob is like good advice, but I'm going to change it. Go on. I'm going to make it mine. <laughs> uh, chaotic. I, I think chaotic unpredictability is not a good thing, but I also do think that consistent and flexible right? You want to mm. have this place yeah. where things are pretty consistent. You know, you're not like yelling at each other one day and then just staring at each other's eyes the next day, right? <laughs> like there needs to be some level of consistency, but right. also this ability for flexibility because mm -hmm. across the core, across time in the relationship, who you are, how you interact is going to change and evolve and grow. So consistency better than chaos, but consistency also needs flexibility. So good advice with a caveat. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I I agree because my first reaction. <laughs> you can't. Jacob, so you excited. can't hear this, but I'm dancing. <laughs> you can't hear it. You're right. You can't hear it. <laughs> Check out our YouTube, YouTube page. It's beautiful. Moves. Yeah, because I am uh, beautiful. <laughs> so supportive. Every, yeah. So supportive. He's being his best self. We should support that. <laughs> that's that's why I have this relationship with you all because it brings out my best self. And 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 Jacob can shine love into the world in this <laughs> podcast right. relationship <laughs> oh, through this audio medium. So yeah, I thought it was bad advice until I heard the word chaotic. 
And then I was like, oh, actually. So okay. I agree along the same lines of what Jacob said, that relationships that are chaotic and unpredictable and volatile are incredibly stressful. Our, our bodies cannot, yes. they don't do well in environments where we can't predict what's coming next and everything feels like it is just, it can be hostile. It can, it's just, it, the word chaos is a perfect word for relationships that need shifting. Yes. Consistent is not the opposite. Consistent is not a word I would use to describe healthy relationships. I would Mm. use adaptive that if I healthy relationship is one that in different situations can, as Jacob said, flex, but also over time that respond to kind of what we need and what we need from each other. So I think adaptive and responsive are maybe words I would plug in for instead of consistent. Yeah. So I think generally we're saying good advice with some of our own definitions of, of consistent and what that should mean or what that looks like here. Conflicts are spaces where growth can occur, not where harm is inflicted verbally or physically. Good advice. If conflict is a place where you're getting harmed verbally or physically, that is a huge red flag. Right. And something that needs to be addressed with people you care about, with a therapist, and make sure you're safe. So setting that aside. The first part a place for growth. So I don't think that necessarily every time you have a conflict, you're going to be able to like, all right, we have a conflict. I'm going to grow, right? Growth can sometimes happen in conflict potentially. I think that's a pretty high bar, but it can also happen in repair. In other words, after you've had this conflict, it's about reflecting, thinking back and saying, okay, how did this come? How, what can we do to think before happened, during, after conflict that, that we can learn from this, that we can grow from this as a couple? So if, if you're thinking about conflict as kind of like that whole span of what's in the relationship, I think good advice. But if you're thinking about in the moment when you're like emotionally flooded, can't really engage well, and you're like, okay, time to grow, setting yourself up for failure. So I don't know where I land here is that good advice, bad advice. I uh, I think bad advice, here, good advice, huge red flag for physical or verbal, verbal. harm. Right. Bad advice to think that you're going to grow in every conflict. Right. Or in the moment when you're really, really frustrated and mm-hmm. your mind is flooded and you're thinking that that is a perfect opportunity to grow as a person. Not only is it not possible, but your brain actually can't process on that mm-hmm. level in that moment. So it's it's bad advice therapeutically, but also physiologically. I would agree with you, Jacob. And science would too. <laughs> Sarah, good or bad advice? I think it's good advice. I think my reaction is similar to Jacob's, but I, I think that growth can happen in conflict. I think sometimes crisis can be a really great opportunity for change to happen. We were talking earlier in a different piece of advice about being willing to learn how to Mm self-soothe. And sometimes that's the growth that can happen in conflict is that I can learn sometimes better how to take care of that physiological response you're describing, Patricia, that I can self-soothe. And maybe that's, maybe that's the only growth that happens in that moment, aside from kind of growth that can happen in the relationship and how we learn how to do the dance of conflict a little bit differently. I do think conflict can be a place where growth can happen. I, I agree that it's a high bar if the advice is conflict is the place where growth happens. Uh, All conflict can include growth and that huge amounts of conflict are, (laughs) should not be equated with just, I keep growing and growing. (laughs) I'm so tall. (laughs) We have such a healthy relationship. We find out the time. Oh, so much arguing. I'm so tall. So I think that (laughs) that is probably a problematic interpretation, but I'll just give it good advice for in general. Okay. A little bit of good, a little bit of bad. Just be mindful about when I think when you're engaging in conflict, I think the most important part is that it it doesn't include verbal physical attacks, I think is really important. And that would be a green flag. Okay, last but certainly not least in our long line of advice, you support each other and lift each other up in front of others. There's no belittling or putting down or put downs. Good or bad advice? Good advice. I think if you are in a situation where 
someone you care about and there's other people around is using that time to belittle you, make fun of you, make you feel small is a huge red flag. And I like the the other part, right? Like, it's not like you want your partner to go around and be like, oh yeah, my partner's so badass. Let me tell you about it. But, you know, like- we Do we talk- not? That's not something we want. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I don't know about that voice, but- <laughs> <laughs> Right, true. Ha, I'm open to but, it though. <laughs> you know, like I, I okay. do think that, you know, talking well about your partner, especially in a way that- is authentic to how you see them and understand them and experience them is, is healthy because the people, other people that are important to you, they want to know that you're happy and engaged in your relationship. So I I think good advice. Good advice from Jacob. Don't belittle your partner in front of other people. Woods, good or bad advice? Yes. Good advice. Also don't do it when people aren't around. (laughs) (laughs) Just don't do these things. It's one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? To be really (gasps) critical of your- Right. (laughs) You legit scared me. I was like, do I have, do I have it wrong? That's where my insecurity went. (laughs) No, you're right. I just- a secure podcaster. (laughs) (laughs) I just always feel like four horsemen of the apocalypse of relationships should be with the sound dun 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 so I was trying to do that not to scare you sorry no it's too late I mean no I mean good that makes sense yeah I think being really critical of your partner is super problematic it that is not how growth happens in conflict but doing it in front of other people is toxic that is awful it is it is one thing Wait, actually, I'm going to Why are we laughing? But go ahead. Because because I think it's one thing if the climate of your relationship is such, like my my husband and I are very sarcastic and joke with each other a lot and are really comfortable teasing each other back and forth in front of other people. But belittling would be a hard boundary for me and for him and not at all acceptable because that is the way you're describing it, something that is really just toxic and negative and problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Yuck. So this is good advice for a green flag in a relationship is that your partner does not belittle you or put you down in front of other people. (sighs) Hopefully not, you know, behind closed doors either. That would, that would also be, I think a a green flag is that they don't do that. Have you ever been around like in a social setting though, where like yes. a couple is doing that yes. to each other and yes. it, it just makes you really so uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Right. Like, right. Oh, oh, Yuck. Oh. Right. Yeah. Not good. No, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So don't do it for your relationship's sake, but also <laughs> don't, don't make other people uncomfortable. Don't, don't make other people feel uncomfortable. <laughs> That's the real take home message here. Don't do it because it makes other people feel uncomfortable. Especially when you're a couple therapist and you're like, shit, do I, I don't, now what do I do? <laughs> this is, I feel like I got to call this out, but I'm not here to do work. This was supposed to be a dinner party. <laughs> so really don't do it in front of Sarah and Jacob because it makes right, them we, feel super uncomfortable. Obviously we, we look uncomfortable. We're going right to start now. charging you. We're like, all right, we're on the clock now. Ew, I don't like that. Shut it down. <laughs> Oh, as always, bring in the gems, y'all. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners. Thanks for listening to Attached. Remember, call us, email us, get at us on all of the social medias about any relationship advice you've received that you're wondering whether to follow or pass on. We cannot wait to talk.